the government. Um, we are part of the United States Digital Service, which is a family of different um, digital services inside agencies and um, the h and uh, group, which we focus mostly in doing project work for um, all these agencies. We are an open source team, so everything that we do is out in the open. And um, we are here to talk a bit about DevOps. Um, DevOps is hard. I mean, th there's no way around it. DevOps in government is a pain. Um, you may say, well, I mean, I work at an enterprise, and uh, it's not easy either. But trust me, it is worse. Um, we have laws, we have regulations, we have um, security teams that go in and take a look at what we do. And um, you know, procurement people, uh, it's usually pretty interesting to try to deploy something in the government. So in the past, uh, if you wanted to deploy something, um, the way that it would work is that you know, you have your application. You, your application is there, or you know, it's mostly there, and you say, I want to publish it. I want the public to have access to this. So you document what you had. Um, you present it to a change management board, because yeah, of course we have those. Um, you procure the servers, you know, get bare metal, and you set them up, you uh, configure them. If you're lucky, there's some sort of virtualization in there that you can run. Um, you apply your app configuration, you know, probably shell scripts or chef or something. Um, you deploy your application code. You run a lot of security scans, which can take a very long time. This whole process and submit it again for another, some other people to you. And finally, you get an approval to launch. Um, this process, this whole thing can take 14 months. So good luck being agile there. Um, if you want to deploy a change to the application, you still have to run through a lot of hoops, and you still have to get that approval, which you know still prevents you from doing agile work and be iterative and that kind of stuff. So a lot of agencies uh, are following the trends today and say, there's this cloud thing going on. We should get some cloud. Um, so we have this thing, and it's just cloudier. Um, we, instead of procuring servers, which is, takes you know, a couple of weeks, we an instant somewhere. But the whole process you know, is still untouched, still takes a very long time. So at HNF, we like to change things. We like to break the mold. And, um, they hate us, but you know. Um, so one of the things that we said, okay, we have um, these things that we do for every application that they look the same. I mean, when you're deploying an application, pretty much it's the same thing every time. Um, the only thing that changes is the application. So we said, okay, let's package things only once, and then your application needs to, you know, can be deployed on top of that. So we created a common architecture, basically baked an AMI, documented everything that had that AMI. And when the developers wanted to uh, deploy a new app, they just uh, there were some issues uh, with this approach. Basically, one of the biggest problems was um, that we didn't know what was going on. So if you wanted to update the base image, um, who is using what, where, uh, there was no inventory service of what we were running. Uh, that. So why do they have to write that? Um, billing. We, we can't give away stuff for free, so it's a pretty uh, big issue if we do. Um, so we had to create some uh, billing options within the, the infrastructure that we had. 
and that involved a lot of manual tagging and stuff that was pretty ugly. And developer productivity with all this took a pretty big hit uh, because again, they're writing manifests or um, recipes or whatever when they want to write their applications. So we took a step back and said, this is not really working. This kind of sucks. Um, let's try to figure out what's the best way of doing that. And that brings us to the present. Uh, it was pretty obvious, at least for me and our group, that path is the price DevOps. If you have multiple you know, heterogeneous projects, you probably want to pass. So we said, okay, let's take a look at the passes that are there and see what we can deploy. Uh, so we had a, pre, a, a set of constraints. One was that it was open source, that had multiple language support, that was dev friendly and ops friendly, and that it supported multiple infrastructures. We didn't want to have vendor lock-in. One of the, again, again, big things in government is that we don't want to have uh, our software be tied to one provider. So these are the ones that are, you know, meet this criteria, at least at the time that we were looking at them. Um, and, you know, we had a pretty fun You might have guessed which one. Um, so Cloud Foundry for us, it was, you know, again, pretty clear that it was the uh, platform that we wanted to go with. Um, basically, you know, it's just being production ready. You know, you would be amazed if you go talk to one of these uh, other platforms, they're like, wow, I'm not sure if you should deploy this stuff with, with our platform. <laughs> Wait, Cloud Foundry was like, yeah, come on in. Um, it is multi-tenant, it is enterprise friendly, so like, you know, some people don't think that much about the, you know, UAA or spaces or organizations, but for us it's amazing. It's all baked in. Um, it, it has, a, you know, the community and the foundation, those are, you know, fantastic. And there's one thing that as an ops person, you know, I got to love and that's Bosch. I don't know what Bosch is, you know, go check it out. Uh, <laughs> go Bosch. Um, it, it, Bosch is the, the thing that is allowing us to have open source manifests. We have the description of our, all our stack in our GitHub repo. Um, we have um, everything that is going on. I mean, it's, even if, if it's small, it is there. Um, it allows us to do that multi-deployment stuff that we wanted. So like, if we want to have a staging and a production environment, we can do that. But also, it will let us do stuff like um, Agency A can have its own cloud and Agency B can have a separate one. It has its own audit logs, so we know what everyone is doing. And there's this thing that if you, if you use Bosch, you know, but it feels safe. When you're running Bosch, it tells you, hey, you're about to do this. And buying something in Amazon, it tells you, you want to buy, buy, uh, are you sure about that? And you click yes all the time, whatever. But when you're deploying a platform, you want to know exactly what you're doing. And Bosch is usually pretty safe, and in, you know, when something breaks, it tells you about it, and you can fix it. And lastly, it lets us do this layering thing that we were doing before, so we have the stem cell that we can review and we can review jobs uh, on a case by case basis. So we decided, okay, let's have a real full fledged pilot for Cloud Foundry and see how it works. Uh, it would be an internal platform. We would have to have multiple languages and multiple frameworks deployed in this platform. It would have to leverage AWS because that's what we were using before. Um, we had to create some small services inside it to see how the framework works. And it, it has to be able to deploy production apps. So we, within this pilot, even though we knew it was gonna be a pilot, we wanted to have applications that are gonna have real traffic going in. And lastly, we have a very small team for that, it's just three people and 
we, we had to say to reduce the load on the team. We were hammered before we were doing this pilot and it didn't make sense to deploy something that it would have more load on the team. So how's it been? Oh, awesome. Um, we have been running this platform for five months. Well, we have about 100 app instances, which is not a lot, but it's something. Um, about 50 users. All, and this is all internal stuff. I mean, only 18F. Um, we have some production apps that I can't really talk that much about, but they're, they're there. Um, the user management that we have today is a hundred times better than what we had before. Basically, when someone left the company, I mean, the company, the agency, before, it was a pain to get rid of someone. Uh, but now it's just, you know, UAC, the lead user. Um, and we have, we are able to say, hey, what should we build this uh, agency? And it's just right there. Developers love Cloud Foundry. Our, our team of development just loves it. Um, I asked around for quotes about it, but um, they were asking developers for co quotes is tricky. Um, there was one serious one, which is you know um, about how faster we're doing ATOs now. ATOs is the authority to operate, basically the approval stamp to get a project out in the open. Um, some projects before Cloud Foundry and a lot of other bureaucratic hacks, this is not just Cloud Foundry, uh, would take about a year, and now they're taking about two or three days. And that's pretty cool. And then we have some random uh, other quotes, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, if you take it, the Cloud Foundry away from us, we will hurt you, or we Cloud Foundry, I went from punching myself in the face to punching other people in the face. <laughs> so, what did we learn so far? Um, we learned that developer happiness and productivity can be pretty de deploy stuff. So, if their deployment environment is awful, and it takes a lot of work, then they're not gonna be happy about it. Um, having a common architecture is a big plus. Cloud Foundry has its limitations. You can only deploy 12-factor apps right now with Diego, you know, with me. Uh, we're gonna be able to deploy other things. Um, but this 12-factor limitation is great because all our apps now look the same. They, they look pretty similar. Uh, we have a much better utilization rate on our servers. Before, we were spinning you know, redundant stacks and whatever uh, that had no usage at, at all. And with Cloud Foundry, they are a lot better. Uh, one of the important things that when you're deploying Cloud Foundry is that you should spiff your manifest. We learned this. It, it, it was awful maintaining like, you know, that huge YAML file. If you don't know what Spiff is, it's basically a tool to wrangle YAML files, a configuration for Cloud Foundry. It is what CF release uses. Um, and it, you know, you need, you, you just need it if you're running Cloud Foundry. And there are some other things that we learned. It's like, you need to document everything as you go because some stuff, you don't know how to do it again if you don't. <laughs> Uh, and it's also very important for your team, for your development team, for your operations team to see how to do things and uh, how, you're, how you are doing them. It's also very important to contribute back. I mean, whatever you're doing, we're in an open source community, it's very important to contribute back. And, uh, you know, communicate. Communicate with your team, communicate with the community. And don't be afraid. I mean, this is a very welcoming community. I, made thousands of dumb questions about it. And the other thing is that, you know, don't be afraid of going in the source code, taking a look at things. There's no magic going on. I mean, I, I found it again, the hard way, the, I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And you know, it's all there. So this is all great. And uh, we 
do want to take it farther from here. We want to um, see what goes on uh, with Cloud Foundry and our platform, but we do want to expand on it. Um, we have a couple of things in progress right now, which are you know a lot of CLI plugins for the ECF CLI. Um, so you know to improve pro uh, productivity for developers. They're pretty simple. Uh, we want to in improve our monitoring right now. It kind of sucks, but it's going to be better. Um, one of the things that I mentioned before was that we are in Amazon and we want to leverage their services. So RDS broker, so we can have databases created um, from the platform for our developers and they can 